I'm here with Dr. Guy McPherson. Guy, for anybody that isn't aware of you and your work, could you tell us a bit about your background and uh, the work that you do? Sure. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. I, I uh, It's an honor to be here. I love what you're doing. I really admire it. And um, it's great to, great to talk with you. Um, so, yeah, I am the host of the Trauma Therapist Podcast, uh, founder of the Trauma Therapist Project. And my goal really is is simple. It's been to raise the awareness of trauma and to help inspire trauma therapists and people who are interested in learning about trauma and working with those who've been impacted by trauma. Fantastic. And I, I'd just be curious to ask, you know, a bit, bit more about your motivation for starting the, the Trauma Therapist Project. Um, I'm aware that you, you've had, I don't know if you want to talk about it or not, totally fine if not, but I'm aware that um, your brother at one point experienced some PTSD and that was maybe part of the motivation. Can you maybe tell us a bit more about that there? Yeah, it was, it was part of it. I mean, um, it, I'm just trying to think about a long story or short story. I want to start out with the, the, sh the short story is that, you know, when I was younger, I was bullied and that really impacted me. It just impacted the trajectory of my life and, how I showed up, what my self-esteem, how I showed up in relationships. But I didn't realize that, you know, I didn't realize that was one of the reasons why I started this. I mean, I got into, um, I, when I got out of high school, I went into art school and then I started playing music. And then I, uh, left school for like 18 years and I was doing you know, I was playing in bands and I was doing all this adventure stuff. I was doing a lot of writing and I got to a point where I realized that I needed to not just write, but start kind of living what I was writing about. And I started taking these um, kind of adventure adventures period to, to kind of challenge myself and to find out where my strength was, where my guts were in a sense. And on one of these survival courses, um, one of the members, uh, got really sick and myself and this other member, this woman, we started helping this guy. We started carrying him and encouraging him. And it was at that point that I realized that this is what I want to do with my life. I want to help people in these dire situations. So now, now I'm, I'm going fast. So stop me if you need to, but I wanted, okay. so at that point, it's like, all right, I'm going to go and I'm going to become a physician, a medical doctor. And I went back to school after 18 years, had to read, kind of start again and get my, my bachelor's, which was before graduate school. And I just was not cut out for the sciences. And I switched gears and I went into get my doctorate, my PhD in psychology. And I did that. And in my first job, one of my first jobs, I was working with young kids who were showing early signs of psychosis. And our, our job was to assess and, and help these young kids. And part of the job, Niall, was to take these referral calls from parents, from teachers, from other therapists to see if their young kid was right for our program. And 99, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, there was trauma. And a lot of the most of the parents, a lot of the therapists didn't realize what constituted trauma, that bullying could be traumatic, that witnessing to domestic violence could be traumatic, that uh, being adopted could be traumatic. And I got, I was, it was so crazy to me because we would take these calls and, you know, at the end of the call, you'd have a list, right? Like a list of bad things the kid was doing in school, in class. And a week later, when they came into our office for an assessment, it would be this little kid, just, just this normal kid. They'd come in with their phone, playing video games, or their, their, their stuffed animal sitting on the couch. And you'd be like, you'd like, look at your list and then look at the kid. You're like, wait, wait something's wrong here, you know? And it became very clear to me that, it was so easy to see the explosive behaviors and label the kid or punish the kid and not really get to and even understand or even look at 
what was beneath that. And it was always trauma. And that was it. That's was the impetus. So let me stop there. <laughs> wow. It's, it sounds like an incredible journey that you've been on guy. Yeah, you've done so many different things there. Just a couple of sort of quick follow-up questions there. And also I want to say, I, I really admire how you, how open you are about the, the the bullying you experienced in childhood you know i think it's important that you are, you are so open in, the, in that way because um i think a lot of people can carry shame around these things and when people start to talk about them um like or start to, start to talk about them i think it can be empowering for other people and i was just curious as well were you writing about um tra- uh, trauma back then as well or was it were these different subjects well first of all I kind of lost you there for a minute. Um, you you kind of cut out, but let me let me um, say say thank you for for realizing that. You know, when I first started doing the podcast, I wasn't so open about talking about it, and I realized from doing all my interviews and talking to people who've been in the field and who were open themselves about their background, I realized that I needed to do that. And, and yeah, initially I, there was a lot of shame in, about it, but I got to a point where I was uh, able more and more to realize the degree to which it did in, impact me. Um, but anyway, if you could re-ask your question, let me, let me jump back in there. Um, yeah, I think we just had a, a, a cut in the internet, but uh, basically I was just saying about, um, you You mentioned that you one of the things you did when you were younger is that you were writing. Was this around psychology and these topics or was it completely unrelated? It was somewhat related. Really, I was, I was writing about, I was doing, I was writing fiction and I was writing about people, young individuals going out there to be themselves, to challenge themselves, to um, open themselves. And I was writing about this, you know, and I, I didn't feel like I was really living that. And really what what was the uh, impetus there was at one point while I was writing, I got a call from a friend of mine who I had worked with previously a couple of years ago in a, in a different city. And she called me out of the blue and it turned out that she was calling her friends to let them know that she had been living with AIDS for nine years. And I, I didn't realize that. And she was basically calling to say goodbye. And I was blown away by this woman's courage, by her strength in the way she was dealing with this. And I got off the phone and I felt like there's no way that I could have had that much strength and courage in dealing with what she was dealing with and going through. And that was the point where I said, all right, I I love writing, but I've got to find out where my strength is, where my core is. Um, And that, that was it. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. So you've, I think you've recorded over, is it something like 540 podcast episodes or something? Um, Yeah. Yeah. You're obviously, you know, so passionate about this and it's such a, it's such a big driver for you. Um, I'm just, I'd be curious to ask, you know, why is it important that we become more trauma informed, um, both individually and collectively? Why is that so important? Yeah, it's a really good question. You know, I think first of all, you have to define trauma and a lot of times, and this was true, you know, when I was referenced that job I was talking about and I was talking to parents and teachers and therapists and so forth. Oftentimes we people think of trauma when they hear the word trauma, they think of, well, I, uh, uh, combat trauma or rape or being in an auto accident, these huge things. And of course those most often are traumatic for, for many people, not always, but for many people, they are, but it's not, that's not it. That's not all of it. Bullying can be traumatic. Again, you know, witnessing to domestic violence, um, witnessing a car crash. There's so many things life in and of itself can be traumatic. And it's really important to look at it as a continuum. You know, it's not just these, these 
crazy, intense, traumatic experiences that are only traumatic, but these other uh, experiences not being uh, you know, attachment trauma, which is, you know, not being close to or, or attached to your, your parents, your oftentimes it's, it's a mother figure, not having that. Um, people grow up not having that at all. And that can be traumatic. The other thing here is really important now is that people have to realize that what possibly could be traumatic for me might not be traumatic for you or someone else. You know, and um, that that's really crucial. I got lost your question. <laughs> you, well, it was it, yeah. You've you've basically answered it, but it's just it's why why is it so important that we become um, more trauma informed, both individually right. and collectively? You know, right? Well, you know, individually, I think um, it's important for us to realize what in our life might have been traumatic for us. You know, for me, I realized that bullying was really traumatic for me. But we all go through experiences, you know, whether it's, again, whether it's um, uh, bullying or being beaten up or witnessing our parents or growing up in a crazy, unhealthy environment with drugs and trauma and uh, domestic violence and so forth, whatever it is, whatever it is, most of us have had some kind of experience, which probably has been traumatic to a certain degree. And it's important for us individually to realize that for us to take stock of who we are and how we're showing up in our lives and our friendships and our relationships, what, and what our past experiences, what, what are those instances might have been uh, affecting us or impacting us. And the reason why that's important is to be able to be accountable for who we are and how we're acting collectively. Look at us now. We're collectively globally going through a pandemic which is traumatic on, on a number of levels. And it's important for us to realize how we're responding to that and how we're reacting to that. For me, initially, when this happened, ma'am, I was freaking out. I was, I was a nervous wreck. I was home with two kids suddenly who, you know, one, my daughter was five. My son was 11. My wife was working. So she was out. Fortunately, she was working and I was fortunately able to work from home, but here I was with two kids. I was going nuts. And I real, and, and I was following the news, like what is going on? And I was going nuts now. And I realized that I needed to take stock and take hold of myself and to really create a boundary of what I was going to take in, in terms of information and news. And that was something that I needed to, to look at for myself. And obviously not everyone's going to be a, a, a crazy anxious, not like me, but to be aware of, of what's going on and how we're, how we're acting. So I think it's pretty important. Just a quick break here to tell you about an exciting new membership we're developing, and then we'll get right back to the show. This gets you access to our mastered library of over five years of psychology conferences, including over 230 talks and interviews with the world's leading psychologists, professors, and authors, unlimited CPD certification, transcripts, quizzes, premium passes for our annual conference, online courses with Richard Schwartz and Deb Dana, and more. The cost is £97 for one year, which breaks down at around 27p per day. The best bit is you can try it out for 30 days completely risk-free, as all orders come with a 100% money-back guarantee. If you're interested, please go to twumembers.com for more information. If someone's listened, listening to this and they suspect that they might have maybe experienced a traumatic, something traumatic when they were younger, but they haven't really dealt with it or whatever. Is there any ways that they can identify or, um, yeah, become aware of, um, that they might've been traumatized, you know, any symptoms of it that they might look out for? Yeah, that's a really good question. And the, the tricky thing is that, there are so many symptoms. And for example, trauma oftentimes shows up in, in young kids as depression. 
Um, and for many of us, it can be, it could show up as anxiety. It could show up as uh, OCD, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder. It can show up as um, depression. If you feel something's going on, you know, a lot of us feel, can, can feel if there's something off or something that's not right. And a lot of us sometimes when that happens, we overeat, we can become obsessive about exercising, we can use substances. Um, if we have an idea that something doesn't feel right, I think a, a good thing is to go see a therapist, to talk to someone who is experienced and trained in working with trauma. And you can find that out either by their website or by calling them specifically. Um, but you, this opens up a whole other question, uh, Niall, of you know addiction. And oftentimes at the bottom of addiction is oftentimes trauma, is oftentimes abuse or neglect or uh, various types of um, uh, PTSD or complex PTSD et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's important for uh, us to take a look at, you know, how are we feeling? What is going on? Um, do we feel comfortable in ourselves, in our skin? And it's, it's easy. It can be really easy to skip over that and say to yourself, no, nah, that bullying. No, that was kids do that. That wasn't traumatic or uh, my mom. Yeah. My parents got into fights, but that was, didn't bother me that much. Well, the fact of the matter is it might have impacted you. A hundred percent. Um, I, I think something that would be interesting to ask you guy with your experience in this field, you know, I'm sure there are myths and misconceptions around trauma out there. Are there any that really bug you or any that really frustrate you ab about it? I guess one of the things is that, you know, dismissing, uh, instances or experiences. For example, oftentimes, you know, going back to that job I was working at and we were taking um, phone calls, it, a lot of times parents, when they called in, you know, we would go through this list of questions and ask, ask the parents, you know, has a kid ever experienced, um, uh, have they been scared? Were there ever experiences where they were frightened or scared or didn't feel comfortable or didn't feel settled or, uh, or were bullied? And there were some instances where parents were like, yeah, but kids do that. Or yeah, but that didn't really happen. Didn't bother them. That to me uh, was, was kind of a red flag. It, I don't even want to say a red flag. It's just really, it happens as a result of just, ignorance, right? The parents aren't educated in, in that instance. It's just a matter of being educated and understanding what can uh, possibly be traumatic. I mean, look at this life we're living in. I mean, it's hard not to move through it without experiencing some kind of trauma. Again, if you look at it on that continuum, um, and I'm not saying each experience is going to be life-threatening, but these certain instances can really, uh, you know, impact and disrupt your nervous system such that, you know, any you you could try to uh, help that in any, by any number of ways by using drugs or overeating or doing X, Y, or Z. So it's really important, I think, to uh, ha go easy on yourself and to allow for the fact that, you know, X experience or Y experience, maybe it wasn't traumatic for you, but it possibly could be traumatic for someone else. A hundred percent. And you've, you've touched on it briefly there, Guy, about, you know, the nervous system. And it seems that in recent years, we're moving, um, our understanding of trauma is moving in the direction of there's a big link with the body. You know, it's not just about treating the brain and the mind. It seems to our body seems to play a huge role here. Could you maybe tell us a bit more about that there and some of the work being done in that area? Sure. Well, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's funny that you, you mentioned that because, um, you know, the first person, first people that come to my mind are, you know, Peter Levine and Stephen Porges, who's famous for the polyvagal theory, Bessel van der Kolk, who's done incredible work over decades. But, 
you know, initially trauma was thought that it, it was something that we experienced that, you know, get over it, right? Just forget about it, work through it. And with the work of, uh, you know, Dr. Peter Levine, who realized through research and uh, his uh, observation of animals in the wild, that it wasn't just impacting our minds, but really it was a lot trauma, traumatic experiences were lodged in our body. What does that mean? It means that a traumatic experience uh, can really distort and disrupt our whole nervous system such that when we talk, start talking about symptoms, uh, people shut down, people start to get depressed. And initially, when people began treating that, it was it was solely through talk therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, CBT. And recently, recently within the last, I guess, maybe 10 or 15 years, people were realizing that in order to, to work through this and treat through this, and again, as I say this, everyone's different in how they're going to respond to treatment. But it was realized that in order to work through trauma, traumatic experiences, that the body had to be engaged. What does that mean? That means people had to learn to be comfortable in their bodies, to be to feel safe in their bodies, to feel settled in their bodies. And there are a lot of different modalities that uh, address that. Yoga is one. Um, you know, when you talk with Bessel van der Kolk, he's a big advocate of of um, uh, drama and theater and engaging with other people in relationship mm -hmm. and so forth. But this wasn't really understood till again, recently. Again, it was just thought that, okay, now I'll come into the office. Let's talk about what's going on. Well, that doesn't work for a lot of people because it can re-trigger people, right? By just by talking about what happened to them years previous, they could become re-triggered. Um, so anyway, that that's some of what's been going on. Uh, that's you've you've explained that very well. Um, for somebody that is listening to this, and you know they they're thinking about they're thinking about maybe taking some first steps to get some treatment for trauma they might have experienced. Um, have you got any advice for them on how to figure out which modality might be the most effective for them, whether it might be a body-based approach or a mind-based approach or any, any tips there? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think really um, first I would say the connection with the therapist is the most important thing. Um, connection with a trained trauma therapist and that's not always easy. It's going to be, it can be very challenging to find someone, number one, who's adequately trained, who's trauma informed, and number two, with whom you have a good relationship. And if you don't feel like you have a good rapport with them, a good relationship with them, and again, this might take a couple sessions, leave them and find some, go find someone who you feel that you can really connect with. That's, that's really important. Don't give up. It, it takes time to find that, that connection. Um, number two, if hopefully they're, they're trained and, you know, the modality it's, it, it can be, re there are so many different modalities and the chances are that your therapist, I mean, the, the chances are next to zero that your, your therapist is an expert in all the modalities out there. But the really now the most important thing is having that connection, feeling uh, safe with them. Because if that person is trained, if they're trained in, let's say, a specific modality, let, let's say sensory motor psychotherapy, if they're trained in that, and uh, they might realize that you one needs or could benefit from a different modality. Number one, they, they could learn that modality or number two, they can make a referral for you, or they might even be able to help you with the particular modality that, uh, you know, they're, they're an expert in those things are crucial. I think that's so important. You know, a therapist isn't like something that you, you have for life. You know, you go to one session and that, that is your therapist forever. 
like it, it, it seems that it's so important to find someone that you feel a genuine connection with that you can really open up with. And if you don't have that, it's okay. You know, you're, you're not going to ruin their life by saying like, look, <laughs> I didn't feel that, you know, and, and, you know, I need, I want to speak to somebody else, you know? Right. Right. And, and oftentimes it's not always easy. People, you know, find a therapist and they feel, Oh, it's okay. It's okay. I don't want to, I don't want to leave it. Maybe they're scared or fearful to leave, but you're right. You're not, you're not going to, you know, hurt the therapist. It's your duty. You have a duty to uh, find a therapist that you can have a good fit with. And I would commend uh, anyone who's feeling like, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I feel maybe, you know, after listening to this, maybe I do need to find someone. Maybe I do need to get some help. I commend anyone who does that because it's not easy to reach out for, to help and to say, you know what? I'm a grown man. I was bullied. Who wants to admit that? No one does, you know? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So another question I'm curious, curious to ask, Guy, is you've had, is it, I think I checked, it was 544 guests on the show, right? And these people are pretty much all excellent at what they do in in trauma therapy, you know, and I just, you know, you've spoke to so many people. Have you noticed any common patterns among these people that makes them so effective in their, in their work? Cause we get a lot of mental health professionals that listen to this and they might be curious just to know, um, know that. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, I think there are a number of similarities and common denominators. Um, but I think what's also important is my lens, you know, what I'm looking for and, and, and trying to draw out. And that is, I think one of the most important commonalities is a willingness for that therapist to be themselves, to own up to, uh, who they are in all their glory and, um, you know, trials and tribulations in a sense. One of the questions I oftentimes ask is if they could share a um, an early clinical error. And initially, when I started this, when I started asking that and I started the podcast, I thought I was going to get an answer like, well, you know, this modality I, it wasn't working or I screwed up on that modality, blah, 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 blah. But it wasn't that, Niall. It was people started talking about um, how they were scared to connect, how they didn't want to reveal parts of themselves. And I'm not talking about unethically disclosing anything like that. Um, and they started talking about the shift that happened when they started letting their guard down and realizing that they didn't have to have all the answers, that they didn't have all the answers, and that was okay, that they didn't have to try to fix and shift and cure. Um, and that released a lot of burden. And that, in turn, created an incredible relationship, therapeutic relationship. And I remember one therapist saying to me, you know, um, it was in response. I think she was sharing something and I, I replied and she said, let me ask you something. What makes you feel like you have to take away someone else's pain? How dare you? That's not your job. You know, that person who's come into your office has started their healing journey months, years before they even got into your office. Your job is to be there as a witness, as a guide. And that really floored me because oftentimes people get into this field because they want to help, right? They want to fix, they want to cure, they want to take away the pain. And you, one has to realize that the therapist's job isn't that. It's to, to be able to be there, to be present, to be vulnerable, to be a human being. And that's not always easy because that requires you being 
willing to look at yourself, to look at your story, to look at your experiences, to look at what's going to impact you and trigger you in session when you're working with someone who's been impacted by trauma. Because it's not a matter of, you know, if that's going to happen, it's a matter of when that's going to happen. And to get to a point where you're able to say to yourself as a therapist, you know, I'm not here to fix you or to change you. Um, when If you're able to get to that point, a calmness, I think, settles in. Um, an understanding that it's not your timeline, it's not the therapist's timeline, but it's the client's timeline and so forth. That's, that's so interesting and, and very well put. Um, from what you're saying, it, it sounds like there's a big link between authenticity and vu- vulnerability, you know, the, being able to let your guard down and, you know, just being real. And it's, that seems to be in some sense, therapeutic in the therapeutic relationship. Huge. You know? It's huge. And, you know, when, when you start talking about uh, CPS, CPTSD or complex trauma or interpersonal trauma, that's where this plays a huge role because then you're talking about relationships and violation of relationships in that sense. And to be able to work with someone as a client, to be able to work with a therapist who is authentic and, and, and vulnerable um, can be initially daunting and frightening, but that is the thing that was probably wrenched from that client in the first place, but that's where the healing happens. You know, when you as a therapist are able to show up as a human being, not like I was when I was doing therapy initially, um, you know, I had this idea that, well, I had, of course I have to know all the answers. I have this degree and I'm the, 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 and it, it was just, it was ridiculous because I, I wasn't showing up as a human being. I was trying to fix and do all these things that I'm talking about now that, you know, oftentimes gets in the way. Yeah. I think that that same principle even applies outside of therapy. You know, whenever you ask somebody something and they don't know it, but they try and pretend that they do and they give you an answer anyway. For some reason, that really annoys me. But if someone just has the courage to admit, look, I don't know. I'm supposed to be an expert in this area, but I don't know. I really respect that because it's, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but. I'm, well, it's, yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree. It's it's called genuineness, right? It's mm-hmm. called, We are so, you know, I I, I, I don't want to generalize here, but I, but I think a lot of us are attracted and drawn to people who are just genuine, you know, who, who are showing up as themselves and we're drawn to people who are able to admit that they don't have all the answers. Why is that? Because it's human. We, we all don't have all the answers. Then when we encounter someone who is trying to put up a front, like you're saying, it, it's very off-putting, especially when they don't have the answer or you realize that they don't, but they're trying to show up that way. Um, I don't know. I, I've just been really intrigued and drawn to this journey of really being able to show up um, as, as myself you know, one of my clients, one of my clients, rather, one of my guests on the podcast, um, she she was quoting a Buddhist master who used the term human beingness. And it's about human beingness and about able being able to uh, exemplify that and to show up just as we are. And, and that can be really challenging for a lot of us to do. A hundred percent. It's just, I think, it, there's such a temptation to wear a mask and put on a front and almost everybody's doing it on a, on a day-to-day basis. And I think I'm just speaking here, you've, you know, you interview people on, on your, your podcast. And I think one of the gifts that you have guy is that you are very good at getting people to drop the mask and be real. And maybe that is because they see that on you, that in you and it just sort of comes out naturally. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I'm just, I know you haven't got a lot of time. So just a couple more questions. Um, for anybody here that is new to the, this world, um, what advice, particularly mental health professionals that want to help people that are experiencing trauma, what advice, any best practices um, for working in a trauma-informed way, you know, just 
and in the early early stages of working this way yeah then that's a, and that's that's another good question and i think you know the the suggestion would be here to get trauma informed i mean if you're not trauma informed that's fine but there are plenty of resources out there uh, plenty of books out there. You know, I mentioned Bessel van der Kolk. He's got a great book, The Body Keeps a Score. That's a great place to start. Um, uh, you know, Kathy Steele is a great place. Bruce Perry, uh, The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog. Awesome book. One of my favorite books. But right, if you're a therapist out there and you're thinking, okay, now's the time that I need to be trauma-informed, because if you are a therapist, you do need to be trauma-informed. Uh, but, the, uh, you know, no sweat, but just get out there and uh, find a resource that you can connect with. Um, listen to my podcast. I don't want to plug my podcast, but it's it's it would be a great way for people to listen to a lot of different therapists and maybe hear uh, a lot of therapists talk about different modalities. Oh, that makes sense. Let me pursue that. Or this modality doesn't make sense, but that one does. Let me do that. Um, so, so there's kind of no excuse because there are so many resources out there. You don't initially have to join some, you know, three thousand dollar workshop, but just pick up something, read a book, and start start from there. Start small. A hundred percent. Um, and you've got, you've recently started, uh, the trauma therapist newsletter where you're providing updates. Can you tell us a bit more about, about your newsletter as well? Guys? Yeah. Yeah. What I wanted to do was to each month deliver a resource to subscribers, uh, that has information on workshops coming up, conferences coming up online and in person, new books and articles coming out and highlight each month, some of the incredible people in our field who are doing amazing work, uh, who are therapists, who are just so inspiring. And I feel it's not just a matter of being informed, but keeping inspired. Let's face it, trauma is no joke. It's hard. It's hard to be in the field. It can be very challenging. And I think it's really important to keep inspired. So what I've done is to each month put together uh, an online newsletter that I send out to subscribers. It's a, it's a paid thing, but it's, it's not expensive, but it, 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 the purpose is to inform and inspire. Um, so that's what that is. Very cool. Very yeah, cool. Thanks we'll for link, asking about that. We'll link to that in the show notes. Um, and where can people find the newsletter online where can they find the podcast? What, what would they search for when they're looking, looking for these yeah, things? It's just simple. Uh, the trauma therapist podcast.com. The okay. trauma therapist podcast.com. My newsletter's there. You can access the podcast there and and everything. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, Guy, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you for taking the time to uh, share some of your wisdom with us. I really appreciate it. And have you got any parting thoughts you'd like to share with our listeners before before you head off or any parting? Yeah. Anything you'd yeah. like to say? Well, first of all, I appreciate you having me on here. It's an honor. And like I said, um, I just really admire what you're doing. Um, and it's inspiring to me to be here talking to you and to, uh, um, you know, be aware of the great work that you're doing. So I, I just want to say thank you. And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed the show. If you'd like to hear the full version, you can do so with the Weekend University Premium Membership. This gets you access to your master library of over 230 talks and interviews with the world's leading psychologists, professors, and authors, as well as transcripts, CPD certification, quizzes, and unlimited access to the recordings from our annual conferences. For more information, please go to theweekenduniversity.com forward slash membership.